Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome back uh, to those of you in-house and those of you who are watching out in cyberspace uh, online. We're so glad that you're with us. Our second presentation is um, a group of our librarians and a sociologist from the Graduate Center and also a professor here at Lehman. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Rebecca Arzola, who is going to start the presentation. It's called Maps, Apps, and Stats, What's New in Quantitative Resources? Rebecca? Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Rebecca Arzola. I'm the Government Documents Collection Development Librarian at the Leonard Leaf Library here at Lehman College. And uh, my colleagues and I are going to be discussing resources and tools that can assist students with projects that involve quantitative reasoning. So the library supports students and data accessibility with print and electronic resources, and we do this in a few ways. First, we stay current and relevant by introducing new services, technologies like apps, standards, and trends. We inform students in face-to-face -face reference interactions through information literacy classes and library workshops, as well as through the library website. We also promote library resources and support students by engaging them through social media like Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. So with student engagement, we have a very limited amount of time that we have with students at the library, so we use our time wisely. Uh, which is why I like this quote on student engagement. It is about engaging learners, making them think and interact in the learning process. So an interactive learning process, although short in time span at the library, can still be achieved when it's focused. So what is quantitative reasoning and why is the library on the bandwagon? Uh, well, using a few words from a Lehman Today article with Professor, with Dr. Esther Wilder, QR is a competency and comfort in working with numbers, numerical data across the disciplines. And that hits home to librarians because we get students from all of the disciplines. So librarians uh, participate in the QR initiative. We liaise with departments to find out what QR projects might be coming up. We teach students where to get stats. And ultimately, we engage them in active learning at the reference desk or a library information session. So where can students get QR resources? Through traditional print books, electronic books, access, accessing articles from databases, and also from government resources. Government agencies provide authoritative current data and statistics on their websites and through apps. Librarians are knowledgeable about current technology, which includes apps, and we need to be. Uh, students have mobile devices and want to work with people who can assist them. Librarians are very optimistic people, so we're thinking that students can look for information on their app when they're waiting on the bus or the train or, you know, getting something at Starbucks. It's, it's possible. So in this slide, you'll notice that our present and future student demographic um, are using smartphones and apps. A Nielsen study states that as of October 2013, 70% of teens aged 13 to 17 and 79% of young adults aged 18 to 24 own smartphones. And the second chart is from Statista, which is a library database that provides quantitative data shows that in 2011, 41% of cell phone app downloaders in the US were 18 to 29 year olds. So where to get apps? Uh, as a government documents librarian, I recommend government resources. Uh, so the apps that you'll see are created by government agencies and non-governmental organizations. And there are many apps, uh, you'd be surprised, from federal, state, city, and local government agencies, and they're focusing on community engagement with citizens. Okay, so the good stuff. USA.gov uh, is the official web portal of the US government. It's like the Google of government information if you ever have gone on it. Um, it has about 192 apps, at least since yesterday. Uh, as an educational tool, I think that apps are creative. Um, it's a way of engaging students with the technology they're using, 
and uh, have almost unlimited access to because students will always have their phones. Um, I chose these apps because I could see students using them for assignments. So there's America's Economy, uh, that's, there's an economics assignment in there. Um, the CDC app, which has health and safety information, public health and nursing students. Uh, Dweller is a new census uh, sta uh, app, and it has neighbor neighborhood level stats. Of the top 25 cities, I see a community assessment project with that. With FBI Mobile, crime stats, that's criminal justice, law, sociology. Labor stats has unemployment rates, hourly earnings. I see a careers uh, assignment with that. And then the school district demographic system from the National Center of Education Statistics. That can be education, political science, and multidisciplinary. And these are other um, websites, the World Bank Mobile, they have like 18 apps. These are a few um, that you could take a look at. Data.gov is another uh, website. Uh, it's a government website created to increase public access to data sets. And finally, there's NewYorkCity.gov. Uh, this is a New York City site. And I've actually used New York City 311 and the New York City Health uh, Guide. It gives uh, restaurant grades to restaurants. So if there's a restaurant you're interested in, you can take a look on your app and see what grade it's gotten. And I recommend Jake's Steakhouse on Broadway at 246th Street. <laughs> they have a really good T-bone steak, so. Um, so uh, thank you. And next is Allison Leaner Quam on open civic data and maps. Hi, I'm Allison Leaner Quam, the education librarian here at Lehman College. And I'm going to talk about open civic data and maps. Lehman students do community research projects in fields like business, nursing, social work, and through the education programs. They have many uh, resources today thanks to technology, the web, and to open government data. In my presentation, I'll set the context for this increase in open civic data and highlight some New York City open data tools that we share with Lehman students. So the US Conference of Mayors created a technology and innovation task force in 2012 with the hopes of making cities more efficient, effective, and easier for their citizens. The task force uh, developed an open government innovation partnership to promote openness, innovation, and to support collaboration and accountability in um, civic government. City mayors hope to collaborate with technology innovators uh, and the open data that they provide, that the city provides to develop new tools and resources. The U.S. cluster mapping site, which is being developed by the Harvard Business School in partnership with the U.S. Department of Commerce, is an example of such a collaboration. And through this map, uh, it, it combines U.S. census data along with industry data to uh, create a portrait of uh, clusters of business uh, throughout the United States. This site could be good for business and uh, economists, but it can also help students who might be looking for employment opportunities in their region and also help them identify regions that are particularly strong in their field. The site's accessible now, but will fully launch in August. So cities are developing policies and plans to make open data more accessible. And this sl uh, slide shows cities that already have data, uh, data, open data policies in place. And the US Open Data Census is a crowdsourced resource. And this site tracks the progress of cities as they make their open data available. We can assess how our cities are doing in relationship to others. Now, I know that this slide is really hard to read, even with my progressives, um, but I wanted to give you a picture of the scope of the project before showing you the top five cities, according to this project, uh, which includes San Francisco, New York, Boston, Asheville, and Sacramento. And the data sets are listed that are in, um, some of the data sets that are analyzed on the site are included here. So the New York City Open Data Initiative 
has a, developed a five-year plan um, to, uh, for the release of the data sets, but right now over 1,100 data sets are available, and this is the largest amount of data sets of any city in the country. And New York City uh, Big Apps, which is the contest that's listed on the top of their website, um, is a competition that empowers people to solve New York City's toughest challenges through technology, data, and collaboration. And there are many uh, challenges that uh, government officials have put forward for people to address in this competition, including Vision Zero, which is the mayor's goal to eliminate pedestrian fatalities, and another is City Bike Finder, the goal of which is to help build a tool to help, cities lo uh, help citizens locate uh, city bikes throughout the city. And the New York City Department of Education is the largest contributor so far to the Open Data Initiative in New York City. But other, uh, many other government agencies and departments are contributing. So now that we have open data, what can we do with it? Well, data can be mapped if there's a location that's connected to it, and maps can provide a visual representation of the data. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, geographic information systems are used to, uh, to create the maps, and Lehman has a terrific GIS department that grants masters, bachelors, degrees, as well as certificate programs. And uh, people in all a number wide range of fields are finding that this is a really valuable skill set to have. The New York City Map Gallery uh, provides access to open data that's been mapped and we'll, uh, take a, we'll go in and take a look at a few maps that have been created using the gallery and we'll actually create a map ourselves. So you can use the mapping tool, New York City Map, and um, we'll zoom in on the Bronx by moving it to the center of the screen. And I always look for the reservoir to find Lehman. Here it is. So Lehman's right here. And on the right side, the data sets, the range, wide range of data sets from different government departments are um, available to us. And I'm going to see, I'm um, doing a community research project in education, so I'm scrolling past cultural institutions to education, and I want to see where the universal pre-K sites are in the Bronx, and where the Head Start programs are, and also where the public schools are. I'll scroll down to uh, resident services, past municipal boundaries, public safety, and in resident services, I'll add the libraries. And this might be a helpful map for an education student who's doing a community research project to ensure that as they survey their community, they're getting a good uh, and adequate coverage of the resources that are available. Lehman Community Connect is a Bronx information portal that was developed by Lehman IT and faculty of collaborative effort here. And it has wonderful information about Lehman and its services to the Bronx. Here you can find a map that details uh, student, where students are doing their field work, which institutions are served by uh, Lehman and its various institutes, among other maps and articles. And the library research guides are the way that we in the library uh, link all of these kinds of resources together to help students uh, locate uh, appropriate resources in their field. And this is a research guide that was created by my colleague Rebecca Arzola. And my colleague Robin Wright is going to come up and present information through a research guide that she created on health and human services. Wonderful. My name is Robin Wright, and I'm the Health and Human Services Librarian. That means that I'm responsible for the health sciences, nursing, social work, and speech departments. And many of those departments come into the library for classes in preparation for assignments, particularly the health science and public health come in in preparation for their community health assessment projects. And 
one of the sources of information that they're looking for is reliable health statistical data. So when they come in, oops, I, I will direct them to um, city, state often, federal most certainly, and if requested, international health data. So for the city site, we go to the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. They have a tool called Epiquery, which is querying the data sets from community health surveys and others. And this is the site. Um, I was going to do a live demo, but I decided to err on the side of caution and go with PowerPoint this morning. So this is an interactive health data tool, very user-friendly by their own admission, but I will second that opinion. And there are a variety of surveys available, and the one used most frequently for classes are the community health surveys. And it's a survey that New York has been conducting from 2002 annually. The most recent available is 2012. And you'll see on the slide that there are a variety of health conditions listed. And the one that um, I often use for demonstrations is cigarette smoking, because it's an issue here in New York as well as around the world. And when you click on, I don't know if you're able to see that, but when you click on, yeah, sorry about that, selecting the question, um, it'll tell you the question that selected. In this case, it was current smoking status. And that status is defined as current smoker, former smoker, or never smoker, which is defined as 100 cigarettes or less. So if you've done less than, I think that's about five packs, you're classified as never smoking. And you'll see the, we're given percentages as well as absolute numbers. Now, one of my colleagues questioned when it gave a number of adults, this survey is 18 year old and above, of 4.1 million, no, they did not call 4.1 million New Yorkers. Um, they would still be doing the survey. But they did sample over 8,500 people and with statistical tests extrapolated the data and came up with these percentages and numbers. The system also allows you to refine your results and you'll see my arrow where you can open up these drop boxes and select different demographic areas. You can also look at trends, and here we have trends for all three classifications from 2002 to 2012, identified by the colors, never smoke in green, current smokers in red, and former smokers in blue. And you'll see where you've had dips and increases in the number of smokers. But generally, um, well, we're moving in the right direction, though it's a battle in New York. And we can also see trends by year as presented in a, um, here with the stats, the percentages. And one thing I'd like to point out, it's a very easy system to extract data from, which is important for students, because their assignments will break up the age groups, the conditions, and they can export these out into, Power, into Excel or various other spreadsheet programs. Next, they're usually given the assignment. Now, after looking at New York, let's see what's happening on a national level. So one of the sources that I direct them to is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, which is also a telephone survey. Precedes New York. This one began in 1984. And this is the CDC's website. So here we're looking at, and all these, we're looking at websites and older technology, but still valuable and still continually being improved. And we're gonna use that tool of the prevalence data and data analysis tool. We'll go in, select, in this case, you can select individual states nationwide, which are the states in the District of Columbia, or states, districts, and territories which is Puerto Rico, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. So you'll select your year, and I remind students to be very careful to select the same year as the city, so we're matching same year, apples to apples. 
and in this case, open up a category, and we open the Dropbox and selected tobacco use. Now, the Fed asked two questions, questions of adults who are current smokers, others where they define the four smoking levels. And what they've done is they've split current smokers into those who smoke every day versus those who smoke some days. And then they also have the former and never smoked. And I actually don't know how they define never smoke, so we don't know if it's the 100 cigarettes or less. Now, most of our classes stop at the federal level, but if they wanted to get international health data, we would go to the World Health Organization or WHO. And WHO is, has, as you can see on their main site, you can select data category. You can select data and statistics. This is the page, the top of the page, it's a long one. And at the bottom, you'll find that there's a category substance use and mental health and which tobacco is listed. And if you were to go into that page, you get some initial stats about the toll of smoking, the prevalence and measures that are in force and are being worked on to be implemented in various countries. The prevalence page directs you to um, information for adults and adolescents, and you'll see, hopefully you can see, a lovely graph um, chart here where they're looking at the prevalence of smoking among adults defined as 15 years or older for the various countries. So, on that note, you can see what our students are using. We also have, and I will take a moment to open that up, in the library, in our research guides, we've actually created a guide for this presentation. And you will find our presentations there. You'll also find links to the resources that we've used. And you don't have to go through the library website, but you're always welcome to come in. But if you were even to go into Google and to browse research guides, Lehman College, and put in maps, apps, and stats, you would find opening subject looking at statistics, you will find our guide. And here we are. And you'll find the links. For instance, with stats, the Epiquary, CDC, World Health are all available here. So thank you, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Esther Wilder. So my name is Esther Wilder, and I'm a faculty member in the sociology department here at Lehman. And I also direct the quantitative reasoning program here at Lehman. And basically what we do here is we run a faculty development program over the course of the year, which meets monthly. And as part of that faculty development program, we teach faculty strategies for effective quantitative re reasoning instruction. In addition to the faculty development here at Lehman, I also direct a quantitative reasoning faculty development program throughout CUNY. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we do and some of the technology and resources that are part of that program. So I kind of outlined here what my agenda and goals are for this very brief presentation, um, which basically I just wanted to, by way of illustration, show you a little bit about what we mean by quantitative reasoning, um, to give you some illustrated definitions about what quantitative reasoning is, and then I want to conclude by showing you a little bit of the hands-on tools that we use in the workshop. So to begin with, I just have a slide here kind of illustrating um, an advertisement from United. And if you look at this slide here, you see it says, we're going places more than 370 to be exact, which is kind of comical because it really doesn't make sense to say um, more than 370 to be exact, that's not precision. And it sort of illustrates some of the things we're doing when we think about quantitative reasoning. Quantitative reasoning involves a lot of tools and skills. It also involves writing about numerical information. So here's another example. I was going to have clickers, but given tech technological issues, we decided against it. But um, this is just a slide here that asks you if you would be willing to count out, out loud dollar by dollar in exchange for all of Bill Gates' of money. If someone made this um, deal with you, would you be willing to do it? Assuming um, you counted every number out loud all the way to 67 billion, would you be willing to make, take that wager? And um, the answer, is uh, that your answer should definitely be no, because if you were willing to count um, all the way to 67 billion, assuming it, you counted about a number per second, which is 
probably an exaggeration once you get to those really huge numbers, you'd be counting for more than 2,000 years because um, it would take you about, uh, for every billion um, dollars, a billion would be um, about 32 or 33 years, okay? So that would not be a wage you want to add. So we want students to have an appreciation for numbers in general, what it means. You know, all these numbers are thrown around in the media all the time, a billion, a trillion. What do we mean when we say a billion? You know, tr a trillion is so much larger than a billion. We want students to appreciate these kinds of numbers, okay? Oops, and I don't know why he's giving me those numbers anyways. But here's, a, this is just another example. Um, called the parable of bacteria, but let's assume, for example, if you start with a jar of bacteria, you put one bacterium in the jar at 11 o'clock, and it's a jar full of nutrients, and the bacteria gobble up the nutrients and double, um, the one bacterium doubles to two bacteria at 11.02. You start at 11 o'clock, and then at 12 o'clock, the jar is just totally full of bacteria. My question for you is, at what time was the jar half full? If it doubles from one bacterium to two bacteria at 1101, and then gobbles up again. So the answer for this question um, should be, anyone want to tell me what it is? If it starts at 11 o'clock and then at 12 o'clock is totally full, the answer would be, it, when was it half full? It would be half full at 1159 if we're talking about exponential growth. So having students appreciate exponential growth, that's another kind of skill a back um, a kind of quantitative reasoning skill. And finally, here's just an example of um, a, a pie chart, having students interpret a pie chart. And I know it's kind of hard to read, but basically this is a pie chart showing the distribution of cremations um, during 1996 to 1997. And um, the question that I raise here is actually one that I do raise in a course I teach on the sociology of death and dying. Uh, and if you look at this chart, I ask you, well, what does this chart show? Is it that and, and the yellow is Protestants, and it's just the distribution of cremations. Does it show, and, and the blue here is Jews, the purple is Catholics, the red is Buddhists, and the green sliver with the 2% is Hindus. Does the chart show that Jews are slightly more likely to get cremated than Hindus, that Protestants are the religious group most likely to get cremated, or 3% of Jews choose to get cremated, all of the above, or none of the above? Um, the answer is none of the above, um, because, uh, uh, this is just a distribution of cremations. It tells you nothing about the likelihood of people getting cremated. And I have to say, I see a sign now that I most up when I was sure, <laughs> told I would get like 15 minutes here. So um, I will try and rush through this pretty quickly, okay? Um, so let me just tell you numeracy. What do we mean by numeracy? Well, numeracy, as you, this is the first use of the term numeracy by um, Jeffrey Crowther, Bauer and Crowther, and basically the term was used to mean a, a mirror image of the term uh, um, literacy, which basically is, is numerical literacy. When we're talking about numeracy, we're talking about the ability to um, kind of this versatility and comfort in working with numbers. Um, the Association of American Colleges and Universities, which I, I think Rebecca gave you a handout, right? Um, which has the definition of numeracy and quantitative literacy. Um, in that handout, um, which basically says that it's comfort and com com comfort and um, competency in working with numbers in a variety of different contexts. Um, Rebecca gave you my definition of quantitative literacy. We use it in our workshop to mean about to mean the contextualized use of numbers, which I showed you in those illustrations. Some examples of QR skills. These are also highlighted in the handout that I gave you. Um, interpretation, representation, calculation, application analysis, assumptions, communications. Uh, so a variety of different kinds of skills we're talking about when we think about quantitative reasoning, okay? But basically we're talking about being able to apply numbers, interpret numbers in all different kinds of contexts in everyday life. These are skills that we want students to have in terms of understanding them in all different kinds of contexts so that they're comfortable in everyday life. Um, and in terms of teaching quantitative reasoning, it's really been emphasized that um, Quantitative reasoning, just like writing, is not a skill that you teach in a single course. Quantitative reasoning is something that needs to be infused throughout the curriculum, and that's why we run our faculty development program, teaching faculty from across the curriculum best practices, because if we're going to address the quantitative literacy gaps of our students, which are 
very widespread for anyone who teaches here at Lehman or any other college throughout the United States and um, our Hispanic serving institutions. Um, these skills are, are certainly a challenge and we really wanna work on them. Um, here, I just have some quotes from some people who, are, um, who have really spoken to this. Lynn Arthur Steen, he's one of the leaders of the QR movement. He says that these programs have to involve faculty from multiple disciplines, um, and especially he thinks the social sciences are well positioned. Derek Bach, um, former president of Harvard, who is noted for his famous book, Our Underachieving Colleges, has said that um, numeracy is something that has to be infused throughout the curriculum, and that's kind of our motto. We're trying to imitate in many ways what writing across the curriculum has done in terms of QR across the curriculum. These are some of the best practices for teaching quantitative reasoning. Um, things such as, and these have, some of these things have been mentioned by Rebecca, the idea of having students actively engaged in data analysis is really important. And these are some of the things that we address in our faculty development workshop in terms of using real world, ap real world applications. We also pair QR instruction with writing since we think they go very, they and certainly go together as the example I gave you for the advertisement for the airline, um, using technology, collaborative instruction, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that is important is, especially at Hispanic serving institutions, is to be sensitive to differences in culture and learning styles. And especially a lot of minorities come with a lot of um, baggage sometimes with regard to math, ed math education and quantitative reasoning instruction, and a lot of anxieties and fears and, and just addressing that head on. So in terms of our workshops, some of the things we do is we, um, as we're teaching faculty how to teach students, we engage faculty in some of these techniques themselves. So ex for example, we do this graphing exercise where faculty graph their courses in terms of quantitative reasoning and writing. So they're kind of learning about tools, and this is um, something we do with Google Apps where they're um, graphing their courses, but at the same time they're thinking about, well, this is a tool that you might actually use with your students in terms of teaching. Um, another thing we do is um, this exercise called the Monty Hall problem, which I'm not gonna go into much detail, but it's an exercise, a probability exercise, and we have all the faculty in our workshop actually engage in this probability exercise, and then they re print out their results in just a Google spreadsheet, and it sums all the results. So, um, I just wanna conclude by, the, Rebecca also passed you all a deck of cards, and if you go to, um, and I'm just gonna go through this really quickly, I'm not gonna go into um, much detail because I know we're really limited for time here. But if you go to um, this website, this is uh, complements our workshop where we have just a variety of resources for teaching quantitative reasoning in terms of um, data analysis tools, lessons, et cetera. Uh, and through the course of the workshop, we engage faculty in developing learning goals, um, developing instructional materials, and assessing these. Um, but we also, on our website, we have a resource center that has um, resources for kind of addressing some basic mathematical quantitative reasoning skills. We also have internet resources. Several of the resources that my colleagues in the library pointed out are also featured on our website, and we also have samples of exercises in teaching modules. So um, that's where I'm going to stop, and I invite you to explore the website because it has a lot of great resources for teaching quantitative reasoning skills. <laughs>